You are now listening to the Supply Chain Secrets Podcast with Brian Most and Don Davis. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Brian Most, SVP of Retail Strategy at Nashix and former VP of Supply Chain at Walmart. And I'm Don Davis. I'm the Senior Vice President of Carrier Strategy here at Nishex and former executive of CMACGM and Hapag Lloyd. And we're back again with our podcast, Supply Chain Secrets. Don and I are very excited to announce we have a very special guest on the show today, Mr. Anthony Fulbrook. He's the president of OEC Group in New York. OEC Group is one of the leading NVOCC freight forwarding companies that was established in 1981. They have headquarters located in Taipei, Taiwan, as well as regional headquarters in New York and branches throughout Asia, North America, and Europe. OEC Group enjoys a strong position in a rapidly growing market. Anthony, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. So, Anthony, the last time we saw each other, I'll I'll never forget the day because it was March of 2020. And we had met in your office and then we were going out to lunch. And the first thing I remember is that this place was not far away, but it took us forever to get there because there was a Costco over off to the side that was just causing all this congestion. And and at that time, there was all this mayhem around uh, paper products and things like that. And then we sat at lunch and it was one of those days where the stock market had halted trading several times. Uh, The NBA had announced they're going to suspend their season and things like that. And it was just at the height of all this change with the pandemic. And it was it was quite a day. How, how would you describe how things have evolved since then? And, and what would you say has been the biggest challenge over the course of the past year? I mean, it's, uh, it's incredible to look back now and realize it was only only a year from 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 then until now and how much has changed in that year. So we we've seen everything happen in that 12 months so obviously after after that was probably the last time that we met um and the country went into shutdown um and obviously in new york very very severely so um and we saw volumes go to record lows um in in that 3 4 5 months and then, and then in the course of uh you know of recovery at the end of the summer We've seen amazing returns in in in, in volumes and, and record growth, so from record low to record high, um, and I I think for for you know industry wise, what was really interesting was the whole world slowed down at the same time, and then the whole world sped up at the same time, which which is something that I've never really seen before, and and that put real challenges uh, you know on 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 for the carriers and and for for the supply chain, but particularly the first country to come out of the lockdown w- was China. So everything that came in and out of China to the rest of the world, it all hit at once. And so typically, when, when, when you peak, not everywhere peaks at once, and carriers are able to be smart and move their fleet around uh, to you know to utilize to cover the hotspots. But there was no the, the whole world came came on this very sharp sort of uh, V shaped return globally all at the same time, and there wasn't. There wasn't the, the the spare or slack capacity from another trade to really to to really balance things out. So we've been under an incredible crunch, really, starting from from September. Yeah, and would you say that um, the other noteworthy thing is with all these um, challenges on the carrier side is that their on time performance has dropped significantly uh, over the course of the past year. H- has that been a, a significant impact for you, or how has that affected uh, OEC? Yeah, I, you know, someone was just trying to describe it to me earlier is the, the, the K shape or the K return. Well, it's everything, the pricing is going up through the roof on, on, on the K, on the K side and, and on time performance and, and service is going, going down the other side of the K. Um, it, it, it obviously it's been very challenging. The, the biggest issues, you know, has this, there's been the congestions called, uh, cause, uh, vessel bunching. And the bunching uh, creates ripples down the supply chain, and that's the that's the hardest part because everyone's on you know schedules are still uh, forecasted a long time in advance, and you're booking on vessels where the vessels are are, are still ten days out, and, and 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 so you're not getting your container for ten days, 
but you've got to do your booking, you know, by by a certain time period. And it's hard to understand, you know, uh, where exactly your cargo is with, within within the within the supply chain. Um, and, and a lot of systems are, are not well well versed in in you know um, you know in showing you know where your cargo is getting stuck. And so it's been a lack of visibility, uh, both from our side and on the client side. And I think that's the hardest thing for people when people understand about delays. But it's get, getting that that consistent, clear message exactly where your cargo is, so you can so you can account for for those delays and try and build it into your into your supply chain model. You know, Anthony, you, you've got a lot of experience in in this industry, and you know, I, I just wonder when you think about the scale. We we we've all talked about going through things uh, in the past, whether it be labor negotiations, port lockouts, um, carrier bankruptcies, etc. I mean. How do you kind of rate this, you know, what we've gone through the past year? Is it is it truly the worst you've seen? And and if so, like in what ways? What what makes it the worst, you know, that, that we've seen in, in, in most of our careers? I I as I said, I, I think we we've seen the whole gamut um in the last twelve months. We we've seen uh, the West Coast port lockout, we've seen, you know, bankruptcy. It, it's all happened. It, not not necessarily because you know, a, a carrier's gone bankrupt, but the extremes of the the bottom end and the top end uh, have all happened at once within within one contract cycle, within within a twelve month period, um, and and that's and it's you know, it's very hard to accommodate huge shifts in in, in volume, especially if you're a carrier or a terminal in your your asset base. You're, there there are only so many units you can do, and if they're no more. Available land or available boats, it's hard to accommodate, uh, you know, the the growth or the decrease in volume when it was uh, when it was very bad at the early parts of uh, last year. And, and it's one of these senses where I think there was uh, at least a hope or a glimmer of hope that uh, that maybe this would settle and be be put behind us. I think coming out of Quarter four, there was this urgency around Chinese New Year, but then maybe a hope that things would settle, and it certainly doesn't seem as if that has happened. What what do you what are you seeing now, and and what do you foresee for for the balance of the year? I think I I, I feel the the U.S. economy is still very strong, and we we have yet to truly come out of out out of uh, the the sort of Corona lockdown. So I think it would be safe for us to to, to imagine that uh, that the back half of the year will still be very strong. The, the American, the, the you know, the American uh, population when it when it comes out of lockdown more more fully will will, will go back to its uh, uh, its old consumer habits. So in the short term, at the end of last year, I, I think uh, um, internet traffic and goods that were were, were uh, house based or garden based did extremely well because everyone's restricted to to those two areas uh, depending on weather but I, I think there are other areas that that uh, there's there's been significant pent up demand that will release at the back end of this year um, and I think we also have a traditional peak season that though though vastly different in in recent years because of internet traffic and some dumbing down of what happens during the holiday season at the end of the year. Uh, it's slightly more balanced, but it's definitely significant. Uh, those two things coupled together should suggest that that we we have a very good quarter three and quarter four, on top of logistical challenges that are already getting baked in to to to, to the system, as in the, the 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 interruptions because of the Suez Canal and the current bunching and rippling effects from 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 what's happening on the on the east coast. Um, and particularly uh, in, in Los Angeles and Long Beach. And, and those bunching of vessels and ripple effects take a very long time to, to, to work their way through the, through the supply chain and, and, for, and for carriers to be able to get those vessels back onto, back onto uh, uh, their original schedules. And, and that's at least three, four months out, coupled together with, with, uh, you know, with a, a return in the economy and an opening, um, an opening up of, of of society in America, I think has has a very strong forecast for for uh, for logistics supply chain and 
and possibly retail as a whole. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest challenges, right? That it's it's based on what we know today, but then you have a ship get stuck in the Suez Canal, and then all of a sudden, all these other issues start to crop up, yeah. and it takes a long time. So it's it's I think just based on the status quo, most predictions are that things will be strong through the end of the year, that we'll see this normal peak season cycle. But, you know, what happens on the other side, you know, could something else that we haven't even thought of yet happen? Absolutely. And I think that's the scary part, because even without that, there's potential that something else could happen, which causes these further delays or further challenges for the carriers. Yeah, I, I think in regular in, in a regular uh, situation, if you're at 80, 90 percent capacity, you, you have some slack capacity to, to make adjustments to. When you're running like we are right now at over 100 percent, there, there is there, there is no no room for correction. And any small any, any small problem, you know, adds to you know, adds its impact because of that. I mean, it's felt far you know for, felt throughout the, the the supply chain and i think that's uh, that's a problem we're in right now we're just so so full we have no room for error no margin one thing that's emerged as part of uh what's been going on in the market are the carriers number of carriers have launched these premium products so msc has their diamond service cma has c priority hapagloid has a booking guarantee how how is that What's your observations there? How has that impacted OEC, and and what are your thoughts around those? Um, I, to, to be to be honest, originally I, when when Carries first launched their their priority products, um, I, I wasn't that keen on it. I, I felt it was very much a, a competing a competing service against the uh, the, the NVOCC and freight forwarder. Um, I, I think obviously as uh, the the situation is. Continue to get worse, then priority products, I think, are have become a more useful tool. And l- looking, you know, looking at all, what's obviously in the last twelve months been been an extraordinary market, and then looking forward another twelve months, it's again, it's it's uh, going to be an extraordinary market. I think we have to approach our our supply chain uh, our supply chain problems uh, with as much creativity and versatility as, as you're allowed. And so I think there is a place uh, for the premium product in a long-term basis. And, and you know, if you, if you are selective with it and you use it in your hotspots to, to fix, uh, fix uh, otherwise unfixable problems, this allows you to keep cargo flowing. The most, the most dangerous thing can happen to you right now is to assume that next month will be better when all, all the signs show us that there's not slow down on your supply chain, lose velocity, and then you get a backlog that you're unable to relieve. Um, and, and, and this is, this is, uh, this is the, big, the big thing that we encourage all our clients to just to keep moving aggressively forward and keep, keep the velocity there to keep the, the supply chain moving. Because any, any interruption now is going to be very, very hard to fix. Yeah, and my observation with these, these premium products has been that carriers are trying to be a little bit more deliberate as we go into the next contract season, that they're being more thoughtful about how they manage MQCs, but they're also trying to allocate some capacity to these premium products. I know a lot of people have told me that, you know, they might've been held back on their MQC or or maybe they went to a different carrier who said, I'm not trying to take new customers now, but I do think that there will be capacity available. It'll just be part of some of these premium programs that the carriers have. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a fine line between um, being creative, strategic, um, and uh, being overly expensive, um, and 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 that's the, the that's the difficulty here that everyone that you know that everyone's trying to navigate around. Um, but I, I, I think that the, the, the carry the, the carriers in the past have have never really tried to be very creative with their product, and you know th- this is. This is obviously signs of a, a different approach, um, and I, I think uh, you know we've never seen the market in the last twenty five years as healthy as this. So the carriers are, are, are approaching this problem from a very different uh, from a very different mindset. Um, I, I think maybe it's a little painful today, but maybe 
as they become more familiar with with a with a, with a better market and and a long term recognition of a priority product, then they will start to balance uh, balance uh, more products in the in the market, not just priority, not just your regular uh, uh, FAK and long term fixed deal, but there may be other other uh, uh, other uh, products associated around equipment availability, you know, on time rail and, and other guarantees. That, that that make that allows you to build a more you know more di- diverse um, uh, solution with the carrier to fix your supply chain needs. You know, I, I think anything with any kind of product or premium product or differentiated service, the key is just can can the carrier deliver on it right with with a high degree of success. And and as you said, Anthony, there some of the premiums that are being charged are, are, are pretty significant. And I think it's tough for a shipper to, to kind of make the determination um, as to whether this is, is a good return on my investment. But um, I think so many shippers are just desperate right now that it, it almost doesn't matter what the price is to pay. And, and, and I'd love to talk a little bit more about, about your customers. You talked about some of the advice that you're giving at customers. Um, I've talked to more um, BCOs this year who have said, I've engaged an NVO for the first time uh, in my career. Um, and not because they didn't want to, but just because of, of the overcapacity that's been in the market, because of the commercial flexibility they've historically gotten because of their size. And, you know, I'm talking about medium to larger size BCOs that went to, to NVOs for, for the first time to, to get help and get access to, to capacity in, in times of need. And I'm just curious in terms of what have you seen? What kind of customers, how how has your customer base changed? Uh, What are they looking for and and how are you helping serve them? Um, I I, I think from from an NVO's perspective, uh, there's always this crossover uh, area uh, between the the usefulness of having an NVO to serve a a, a BCO who feels that they contract for their... uh, their entire volume with the, with the carrier. I think having a NVO in your portfolio uh, gives you a, a. In the past, it was it was looked at a, a versatility move. It, it's a backup, but I think uh, in the last couple of years, when we've had uh, space shortages, then uh, it, it's it's a lot easier to go to an NVO to fix your your long term space demand problems, and I think. Uh, you know, a lot of this relates to the number of carriers who are in the marketplace for years. If I, if I look back, to, you know, 25 years, we've talked about the overcapacity in the market um, and too many carriers in the marketplace. And we encouraged, um, you know, mergers and consolidation. And lo and behold, 25 years later, we now have seven major carriers east-west. Um, and it's not, it's not hard to, 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 to guess what the signaling is between the between the carriers is they're separated into three three major alliances. Um, so and but that was the only way to stabilize to, to, to stabilize the market. Um, so I, I think uh, sorry I, I kind of slightly lost the question there. No, you you talked about now you know this structural change in the marketplace has created this now need right instead of just having an NVO from a versatility perspective. There's now this true need that you're starting to fill. And again, it might yeah. be a different customer coming to you now than has been before and maybe requiring or requesting a different solution. And and I was just curious, you know, are they looking for just space? Are they looking for to leverage rate, you know, access to maybe carriers or services they can't get on their own? What are you seeing them asking for for the most part? I, I think most of them are looking for uh, for space relief. And they're looking for some consistent uh, service out of areas that they really struggle uh, to service uh, that they have small small lanes on. I think I think it's it's kind of a, a two part problem. I, I think the sweet spot for a BCO to work with an MVO is an example. If we take a ten thousand TU um, uh, client that ships uh, ten thousand TU a year, who's a BCO traditionally signs with carriers direct. The best advice for that person would be to sign across three alliances so that you have every sailing schedule. So then you reduce uh, 3,000 TU equally or a close variation up and down from that across three alliances. 
do you only sign three carriers or do you sign six? You're, you're now reduced to 1,500F with one carrier or if you split it again, 750F. If you divide that by number of weeks and, and port pairs, as everyone wants to, to, to narrow down your allocation to, you've got very small allocation by load port. If a port pair becomes congested, you're completely out of options. And this is why going to a larger NVO like, like someone like OEC, where we, we, we have a significant uh, volume and su- significant commitment to multiple carriers, you're able to buy what you don't have uh, to, you know, to, relieve, uh, to relieve flow and keep this, this, uh, this continuity in the supply chain and not allow uh, backlog to build up that becomes very hard to clear when, when, when the market's very, uh, very congested. And Anthony, you touched on it a bit, but but I want to talk a little bit about this whole idea around MQC and what that means in terms of capacity. And I think that this is something that has been a topic for a number of people that we've talked to at NYSHEX about, you know, what it, what it really means and what has been your experience. What are your thoughts on the way we've been contracting in terms of this MQC equals divided by 52 equals your capacity? Is that really the way forward or, or what's been your experience with that, that model as it stands today? Um, well, the, the, the old model was no model. The new model now, I think, is, is trying to, to shine some light on accountability. And, and, and this is what I think ultimately the carriers are, are really looking for, is really determining each week what the accountability is. Uh, f- because for them, the hardest part was operating equipment and vessels, not knowing what was going to get booked each week, not having a fixed commitment. Um, and that's obviously from the asset base side. Don't you know, in your days uh, at, at, at HAPEG and CMA, the difficulty you run into is, you know, week to week to week, you never know what your commitment is. And this is what's truly unique about also what you're offering on the NYSHEX it is it's a, a meeting of minds between both sides, both as a shipper and a consumer, that uh, that you have something you both agree to and you, you must then commit to. Uh, I know on, on the broader side, uh, if you commit to large volumes, it's hard to break down exactly to the container by port pair exactly. But perhaps, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, as we become more and more creative with our products, you'll end up. You know, maybe like in, in insurance, you'd have a general cover and then have specific catastrophe uh, catastrophe cover to cover certain things. And guaranteed space, priority products, uh, uh, port pair allocations uh, would, would be a way of uh, adding consistency back into this supply chain to make sure that your product is continued to, to able to move. But it comes at a price. And I think that's something that everyone has to realize you know, going forward. If we remain um, this busy on a consistent basis, then then the, the the products and the approach has to change, both by by the consumer and by the vendor from the carrier and and, and shipper side. Um, what what's required of each other, um, you know, to, to to make to make this a, you know a successful relationship. Yeah, thanks. I, and I appreciate you saying that because I think Brian doesn't always believe me when I talk about how difficult it is on the carrier side and, and being an asset based company that um, in, in one of our prior shows, I talked a little bit about the challenges of being a carrier. And to me, it's more difficult than what the airlines do, because a, an ocean ship is a little bit like if you took a plane, but you decoupled the seats from the plane. Because the plane might be there, but they're like, Anthony, sorry, we don't have a seat for you. You didn't bring your seat with you, so you can't get on the ship. That's the challenge the carriers face is that they're managing two things. They're managing where their ships are, but they're also managing the uh, container inventory, which is why at NYSHEX we've seen a lot of interest from from carriers to say, hey, this kind of makes sense because now I can plan better because I can see up front what my customers are, are looking to do. Yeah, and, and this speaks to the to the challenge uh, and the difficulty in this industry, right? Because 
you know, without a doubt, the carriers have an unbelievable challenge to manage their networks. And then when you, when you talk on the shipper side, right, they're, they're dealing with a customer base as well, where sure, there's an underlying business that's usually fairly stable that you can count on. Um, there may be some seasonality that you can plan, but at the end of the day, it's really hard to predict what, what consumer demand is going to be. And, you know, things like stimulus and all those have a, a huge impact as to what volumes are or aren't. And so you have these constant moving targets for both the shipper and the carrier to, again, try to meet on what exactly is going to happen in a particular week. And it, it can become really, really challenging. And, and Anthony, you touched a little bit earlier around visibility and, and other things. I wonder if there's, you know, any kinds of, of technology or standardization or things that we can learn from this period of time that, that really need to become a focus for the industry. Are there things that, that also customers have come to you for space requirements, but maybe it is to get access to recording or visibility or other things that maybe help us as an industry kind of collaborate and get closer together to predict maybe what could happen in the future. I, yeah, I, I think we're, we're slow to, to recognize change in markets in, in our industry. And look, looking back 25 years ago in, in the days of an era, I think the, uh, the, the, the up and down movement was significantly less. Obviously, I think technology has sped the market up, consumer consumer habits have changed, as you said, and so you, the, the peaks and troughs get bigger and bigger. Uh, but we still we still insist or or the market still insists on on year long year long contracting uh, in America. I think many markets around the world have now moved away from uh, from year long contracting. Um, so I, I think the commitment versus the price, I think it's okay to have a year long commitment, but I think Pricing probably needs to change to 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 quarterly, uh, if if not monthly, and that allows the carriers then to adjust their their product and adjust adjust their service based on based on what uh, you know what the market's able to to deliver or or pay, and that kind of flexibility forces them to uh, forces them to to uh, accommodate the the peak markets when it when it's there. But make some adjustment in the, the the down markets, and not having to 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 uh, to put on the same service throughout all of it, and uh, but but use one to rob Peter to pay Paul, taking the money out of the peak market to pay for deploying empty vessels during 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 the off season, um, and if you're going to have a versatile approach to supply and demand, uh, we need to have a versatile approach to to how we price it and how we commit as well. I, I do appreciate that you brought up Anera, and uh, I'm, I might uh, post a quiz for some of our listeners to see, uh, can you define what Anera is or TWRA or TACA and these things <laughs> that used to exist. That, that's super fun. Um, so I, I know we're running uh, here towards the end. Um, what, what's going on with OEC and what, what would you like to share for our listeners uh, as far as what's going on with, with your company? Thank you. Well, we, we're... Uh... Obviously, um, you know we're, we're we're very busy as in the market. The the the, the TP trade has been our our predominant uh, focus, but we are we are noticing uh, changes in trends. Uh, we're noting a lot of our noticing a lot of our client base from from the far east uh, is shifting their buying patterns, and uh, we're, we're also looking to follow our clients into into new markets. We've seen a lot of development uh, in. Uh, uh, north south or particularly in, in this case south north from the, the south american market northbound um and also we're seeing uh, a, a lot of uh, uh renewed activity that that was uh, uh typical 20 years ago coming out of the med uh coming inbound into the into the into the us and so these are areas these are growth areas for us and um and also we we're, we're, we're specializing in other uh specialty products um, such as flexi tanks and iso tanks and other things, also uh, outbound as well as inbound. Um, and so I think these are these are uh, particularly uh, areas of focus uh, with us. Um, and also uh, air freight, because of e-commerce, has uh, um, again has risen from the grave. 
um, and, and and becoming uh, be, becoming very fashionable again um, with with just in time, um, and also picking up a lot of the you know a lot of the the slack that's been left by inconsistent ocean supply chain, and the only way to fix that is is also again by by air. So these have been particularly uh, predominant growth uh, areas for us. Um, plus, uh, we, you know, we're continuing to to invest in in technology because I think ultimately that 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 that's going to be the ultimate tool to try to to try and bring more and more clarity to to problems as they occur. It can only be resolved through tech. Yeah, and you see that there's a number of uh, startups and co companies that are developing in this space. Um, and there's been quite a bit of, uh, I think, investment there. So I think it's it's a sign that that part's needed. And it's a question of, you know, who's going to do that? How much does the, what the DCSA standards help the the industry evolve in the space? But I think it's it's very noteworthy to say the technology is improving and there's there's quite a bit of investment there. And it'll be interesting to see how that evolves over the next few years. Yeah, I, I think that's it's going to be the fastest growth area. I think we've seen now a glass ceiling on on vessel size. I think it will get stuck for a little while at twenty three thousand TEU. Now, every time we say that, it obviously it, it immediately jumps the next year. But uh, I think we're seeing carriers buy 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 and build uh, more vessels one size down as, as people are worried about uh, you know about near shoring, long shoring. Volumes moving around to different countries, so everyone needs a practical approach on what size a vessel can get in and out. Um, so I, I think a lot of the carriers will, and, and also freight forwarders, will be looking to develop more and more tech products going forward um, to better serve the logistic world, um, and, and not all, and not all on building boats. Good. Well. Um... Thanks a lot for participating, Anthony. It's been a great discussion. We really appreciate your time and your thoughts. And uh, hopefully we can meet, maybe meet again in a couple months and, and see how things have evolved since we, we last spoke. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Supply Chain Secrets Podcast. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast network. 